Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 1970 Italian giallo film Five Dolls for an August Moon, and it is a Mario Bava film, so I will gush a little bit about Mario Bava and his visuals and how he was basically ahead of his time, as I have with all of my reviews of his stuff pretty much. Which, by the way, if you're into giallo in particular, uh, I have a whole playlist on my channel for giallo movie reviews. I also have an entire playlist for Mario Bava film reviews. Uh, the Giallo one is obviously much larger, but obviously spoilers for this because it is a old film, and I watched it on the Blu-ray that I purchased very recently. Kino Lorber puts out all of Mario Bava's stuff, so that's where you're going to get Bava things. Uh, but I had heard that this was this was kind of on a list of like definitive kind of Giallo from the time that was influential, blah, 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 you know, that type of stuff. So I had just gone ahead and purchased it because I couldn't find it streaming anywhere, so yeah. Anyway, like I said, directed by Mario Bava, who's also directed such things as, it's not all of it, but Black Sunday, Black Sabbath, The Whip and the Body, Blood and Black Lace, Planet of the Vampires, Kill Baby Kill, A Bay of Blood, Hatchet for the Honeymoon, The Girl Who Knew Too Much, and Shock which a bunch of those I have reviews for already, and a few of the other ones I will be doing reviews for, so stay tuned for that. This was written by Mario DiNardo, who wrote scripts for Death Knocks Twice, The Fifth Chord, which I have a review for, The Two Faces of Fear, and Yeti, Giant of the 20th Century. I want to see that one because it sounds like an interesting title, especially from the 70s. Uh, this star is one of my favorites. Uh, this is my film crush, Edwige Fenech. Uh, she was in a bunch of Giallo films. She was well known for kind of doing some sexploitation stuff, but then also doing a bunch of Giallo films and getting naked in a bunch of Giallo films. That's not why I like her, but just saying this was a thing within Giallo, the nudity, and it's on display here. Uh, so would we also start in Your Vice is a Locked Room and Only I Have the Key, which I recently did a review for. The Strange Vice of Mrs. Ward, All the Colors of the Dark, The Case of the Bloody Iris, Anna, The Pleasure of the Torment, Strip Nude for Your Killer, Phantom of Death, and she apparently had a small part in Hostel 2, which I own and I'll, I need to go back and, and rewatch. So, uh, apparently, there were only 19 days for this to be shot. Now, the full situation of this film is pretty messed up. Uh, so, it's not the greatest film, and I will say that. It is. Still a Giallo film, so therefore I am fine watching it, and I will probably rewatch it, especially because I own it now, because I feel like all Giallo is worth seeing at least once, and pretty much for me, all Giallo is worth seeing pretty much more than once, just because I like it that much. It's just the subgenre, really, I love it. I, I really do love it. So anyway, what happened is that apparently the original director who was signed on for this film ended up dropping somehow. Nobody knows what really happened there. Nobody even knows or has on record who the original director was supposed to be for this film. So they then approach, the financiers approach Mario Bava and really tried hard to get him to take the project over because obviously at that time he was a known director. He knew what he was doing. He was really hesitant to take it because he had read the script and he thought the script was not very good which it is not very good. That is the biggest problem with this film, is that the script is pretty rough um, for many reasons, and I'll talk about that as I go further in the review. So in the end, Baba decided to do it uh, under the terms that he get paid up, up all up front, um, but there were a lot of problems with it. Uh, they only shot in 19 days, and that's because of money. They were so strapped for cash that Mario Baba had to do all the editing himself, uh, the other thing is, once he signed on, they said, okay, awesome, you start filming in two days. And Bob was like, what? <laughs> because he intended to actually take a pass at the script and make it better because it was not good in his opinion, uh, and he just didn't have time to do that. So the script stayed basically as it was when Bob got it. Now, I think he changed a few things on set as they were shooting it, but in my opinion, not enough. So this film really is one of those issues of like, the script was not good, but with what Mario Baba did visually, it's worth watching because it looks really good. There's some really interesting camera shots, some really interesting cinematography, directing, all of that, and pretty solid acting to it too. But the story is just so bare bones, it's not that good. And like Mario Baba said, 
at, or has supposedly said about this film before he even took it on was that it's so derived from Agatha Christie's and then there were none that you can tell. So, yeah, that's just the way it is. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, additionally, not only was the budget so low on this film that uh, Baba ended up having to do all the editing himself, but also all the actors had to wear their own clothing. They had to provide their own costumes and everything for this film. That gives you a good idea. Uh, in true Mario Baba fashion, the film starts with a body of water. That is something that Baba likes to do. He almost always features some sort of body of water in his films. It is interesting. Uh, additionally, when it starts, you see this nice house on the cliff. So it's it's this beach and the body of water. You learn later it's on an island. And then it kind of shows this really nice beach house on this cliff. Now, that's very, very similar to the starts of A Bay of Blood and the whip and the body. Those are the, exactly the same. It shows, you know, the a, a, a body of water with, you know, the shoreline right there. And then it shows a very nice big house. Different looking houses, but it's like the same thing. It's it's just like a go-to for Mario Bava to start films that way, I guess. And like, what is his thing with bodies of water? I don't get it. I mean, I don't have a problem with it, but I just noticed that these films start very similarly. Um, I do like initially how they're having that kind of party in the beginning, and that's the way to introduce characters. Now, that said, I don't think, I think it's kind of hard to keep characters straight in this film for a few reasons. One, you get really no backstory on them. Two, there's really no development. Three, you really can't tell through the interactions or through the story who they really are as people, or that they're even interesting at all, because they're not really interesting. And the other thing is that, their interactions are so brief and the, sh the scenes are so like short that you don't get much of a sense of them anyway. So I think it is kind of helpful that they start with this party and they show each person, but you don't know their name at that point. So keeping the names straight, like you'll see the person be like, okay, I remember this person who looks like this, this happened with them, but the names were hard to keep straight because there are a lot of characters. And like I said, they're very much not memorable and there is a lot going on. So I like the party aspect, but it's still hard to keep straight who's who and what's going on. So just saying. The faked killing in the dark in the beginning during the party, I think was uh, an obvious over, uh, overshadowing, foreshadowing moment for the film that here they are joking about someone being killed at the party. And guess what? Someone will be killed. Many people will be killed because that's the whole point of Giallo, as we know. Uh, I like the comment that George is a beast, but ends up becoming very charming when he starts signing checks, therefore reducing his, his wife to a person who is just there for his money. So that kind of creates a potential motive as maybe she's the killer because she doesn't even love George. She could be trying to kill other people and eventually George because she doesn't even love him. And you also find out, I think that's Jill. You also find out that she is uh, romantically involved with Trudy as well, which is another motive right there. And then we also get that additional motive early on of this formula, which for a while it's like this unspecified formula. And then you find out it's for like an industrial resin, which I looked up and basically industrial resins can be used in manufacturing of like plastics, stuff like that. So I guess this is something that could make someone a lot of money, but it's very like cloak and dagger, like typical cloak and dagger, the way they cover the whole uh, formula thing with the little um, strip of uh, film, like the mini strip of film and everything. Uh, yeah, it's just, yeah. I mean, it's the 70s. I understand that. It was 1970. I get it. And that that's why there is a bit of a charm to it, I will say. Why is the dude with the shades whittling wood while while they look at Charles's body on the beach. Charles is the first person to go. He was the cabana boy, I guess. They, they kind of call him something like that, like a cabana boy or something. And Edwige's character, Maria, was having an affair, which her, I think it's is Jack? No, Nick. Nick was her, her main squeeze. And he ends up, like, not caring that she's having sex with this, like, cabana boy dude who ends up being found dead and in general like whenever anyone's found dead no one really reacts properly to it they're all just kind of like 
just kind of like put out by the fact that they have to deal with a dead body pretty much. So it's like, oh man, another dead body, come on. And then they just lug it to the meat freezer, which I do like the aspect in this film of storing the bodies in the meat freezer. I mean, it makes sense, but also it's a cool visual. And I think my favorite thing in the film in general is every time they go back to that meat freezer and keep showing the bodies like stacking up especially with the plastic over the bodies. Now, apparently that in particular was Mario Bava's idea. He added that kind of last minute for the, the actual plastic to be over them because initially they weren't going to be. It adds this like extra darkness to it. Like it's more messed up when you see people presented that way. So uh, I like that touch to it. But yeah, these people don't act properly when when anyone's showing up dead. It's more just like, I'm put out because I have to move this body, and then they're like, okay, let's distract ourselves with having drinks or sex, because that's another big thing. Everything's very sexually motivated in this movie, which is, you know, it happens in Giallo. It's all good. But yeah, um, there's a lot of happy light music in this film for how dire things end up being, which, you know, it's weird because... It mismatches what's going on for sure, and the music's not really very good either, even though it is a product of its time. I'm saying now, watching it now, it's not good music, and it gets annoying, especially because it doesn't vary a whole lot. And I would assume that has a lot to do with the budgetary issues of the film, but um, it just mismatches what's going on. But I think it also creates this kind of like light quirkiness with the film as well. So you can kind of laugh with it and be like, nobody's taking this seriously that people are dying. So yeah, just saying. And no one even seems seems con all that concerned either that there's p potentially someone on the island that can kill them until much later in the film. Then people start to be concerned. But it shouldn't have taken that long for people to be concerned that someone's murdering. Uh, the film is just a series of scenes of one character walking into a scene with another character for the most part, and a lot of them are sexually motivated. This is what I was saying, is that it's a lot of like short scenes of like one character showing up in a scene with another character who's already been in the scene, they have a quick interaction, and then on to the next one. Until you get towards the end of the film, and then you start to have some longer scenes. And that's when they're better, that's when they look better, they feel better, there's a little more story to it. But in the beginning, it's just so chopped up that it's kind of hard to watch for that reason. The scenes are typically pretty short. Uh, oh, yeah, I already said about the chopped up. Bava puts in some interesting shot angles, though, and some really cool panning shots that really keeps you engaged. There's one in particular that I'm going to cite later that, you know, it just goes back to what I love about Bava. You know, even though this isn't a good script, the visuals are really good because this, his cinematic eye is always at work and he has really good cool movements of the camera and frame shots and everything so this seems odd because you see isabel shoot the gun and then she drags jerry's body to the water now you end up finding out the reasoning for that later because jerry's not actually dead he was just tranquilized by her and then she drags him uh drags him and people are supposed to think that he's dead uh, but that whole like Terrible writing. Like, it, it was awful. I do like the fact that they kind of, like, put that in there for her to kind of be a bit of a red herring. But I actually kind of think it may have been better if that wasn't even a part of it at all. A lot of things needed to not be in the script, though. <laughs> uh, there are a lot of into-focus and out-of-focus transitions as far as camera work goes in this film. Notice that. If you rewatch the film or if you think back to when you did watch it. There's a lot of scenes that end or begin with uh, out of focus, in focus, that type of thing. Just an observation. Nowadays, not so great, but back then, it was probably fine. It is a cool shot when Jack finds Peggy dead. Uh, yeah, that's a really cool moment when she's outside and Jack walks out there. They had had sex. And you, you don't know yet she's been shot. So it's focusing on Jack and then it pans down it like comes back out, pans down, and shows Jill was a oh Peggy, sorry Peggy. I'm having a hard time keeping these guys straight. Peggy, it shows Peggy's like face with the bullet hole and like blood running down, like that camera movement, awesome, so good. Like it looks great. It's a very engaging shot. I love those things. Isabel swinging on the swing attached attached to that funky looking tree branch. Just actually, first of all, it's just a random thing to have in the film, and plus. Nobody seemed concerned about Isabel. People just kind of felt like, oh, she's here. Like, 
who is she really? Like, I still don't understand. Like, who is she to these people? Like, they saw her the whole time. No one ever suspected anything of her. And she, she's just there creeping around, like, spying on people. I don't... Weird. Her, her character is terrible. Just terrible. But anyway, the, the scene where she's swinging on that swing, the way it was shot and the way that it looked really reminded me of Mario Baba's film Kill Baby Kill and the ghost child that is, like, swinging on that swing. Obviously, it looked and worked a lot better in Kill Baby Kill, but just reminded me of that. The reveal of Jill being dead in the bath looks really cool, and I like how they ended up getting there where, you know, those glass balls are rolling across the floor, and then you, and it's following them, and then you hear some of them off screen start, like, plunking into the tub, and then it pans over, and you see her dead in the corner of the tub, and you see, like, blood in there, and then the, the note on the mirror about how she can't go on and everything. Um, another cool way to get into the scene, like a really nice, cool, smooth move movement and a cool way to get you to that shot. Very cool. Uh, I love the shots of a character up close and then others further back in the scene. That's done a lot by Mario Baba as well. The one in particular where it's Trudy, Jack and George and Trudy's messing with the, um, the audio recording device and she's like up front in the scene and then behind her is like, I forget in what order, but it's like George and then Jack. And like there's, it's staggered and they're kind of like in a semicircle. They like arc over of where they are. I just think those are visually very appealing and cool. And I think it also opens the scene up a lot more for view, for the audience. So it's just more engaging and you feel like you're more like immersed in the film for that reason. I do like the, the twist of George drugging people. Uh, I do like that, how they were all drugged, and then I guess he moved the bodies and cleaned everything up so that when, um, I think it was, no, I'm sorry, that was Jack who did that. God. <laughs> when George's, um, yeah, George's yacht crew was supposed to be showing up, and they walk around, they're like, nobody's here. I mean, obviously, they didn't search everywhere because where they were somewhere. But I, I do like that kind of twist where, like, you see it play out, and then they come back to it, and then you find out that it was Jack who had, you know, pretended to be drugged as well, and he drugged Trudy and George, and then, you know, they were trapped on the island with him, and he had this master plan that he then un unveils to, I'm going to kill you guys, and then, you know, take the boat out and, and set it on fire and sink it. So I did like that. Does Isabel have nothing to do with her life? She's just sneaking around all day and night. Her character is horrible. Once again, I'm going to say her character is terrible. She makes no sense. But whatever. That's Giallo. That's part of the nostalgia now of watching these films. So Trudy and Jack seemed that they were independently going after people. And we're going to end up taking everyone out. I do also like that aspect of having kind of... You think it's one killer, but here we go. There's another person trying to do something and another person. Because in the end, you had Jerry, who was kind of this mastermind of this, of this plot with Isabel. And then Isabel undercuts him in the end, basically. But then you had these other people involved. So there's a lot going on, but it could have been executed a lot better. Script-wise is what I mean. Isabel seeing Jerry in jail clarifies the scene where it looks like she killed him and then was dragging his body, but the whole thing with him confessing to killing because of the sodium pentothal that she shot him with is dumb. That is unbelievably terrible. What a stupid idea in the script. It's, it's so dumb. It's so dumb. I don't know how other people feel about it, but I thought it was terrible. Uh, real beautiful shooting location. I love the shooting location as, in this. I think that's one of the other things that kept me engaged in the f film, other than Mario Bava's directing and the cinematography. Um, the characters are unbelievably paper thin. Like I said, there's no backstory. There's no personality. You don't know who they are as people, really. They, if they have motivations, it's all, it's boiled down to one thing, pretty much. So, yeah. Uh, the music gets annoying, like I said. Uh, I think that Bava did what he could visually with this film with a really bad script. Now, I would have seen what I would have liked to see what could have happened if Bava had that time ahead of shooting to rework at least part of the script. 
I think it could have been a much better film, but as it is, I mean, it's still worth watching. Like I said, it's not the best as far as Giallo goes, and it ranks pretty low on my Giallo watch list, but yeah. And like I said, my favorite thing about it is just continually checking in on the body stacking up in the meat freezer. I really like that about the film, so yeah. It's a it's a good enough time, in my opinion, and I enjoy it. So, out of five... St <clears throat> Jesus, I'm sorry about that one. <laughs> Putting stress on my voice because I'm getting so emphatic about how much I hate the script. Uh, so, out of five stars with half stars in play, I feel like I have to put it at a two and a half. I think if the visuals weren't so great, I would put it at a two or a one and a half, to be honest. But because of what Baba brought to the table... I'll go two and a half. I thought about maybe going a three, but I, I just don't think I can justify that with how bad the characters are and how dumb a lot of the turns of the of the story are. So I'm going two and a half. But anyway, I would love to hear your comments about this film. What do you think? And just Giallo in general. Go ahead and put it down there. And do me a quick favor, though. Hit that subscribe button. Uh, if you like this video or any video I've ever done, that is your best way to repay me. And please repay me in that way. Just take that quick second subscribe and then also hit that notification bell because that way you'll know whenever I'm putting up new videos whether it be another movie review or an unboxing or a haul video or any anything I do but uh regardless I do thank you for taking your time to watch this and until next time keep it brutal <laughs>